Welcome to the Cooper Critical Care Podcast. My name is Haney Malamat, and I'll be your host for this session. In 2018, Cooper Hospital held its first annual Cooper Critical Care Conference. That's the C4 for short. And it was a huge success. We had speakers from all over the South Jersey and Philadelphia area, and it was a packed house. Well, March 20th, 2019, we're doing it all over again. And this conference is going to be even bigger and better than last year. We're going to have See Me available. We're going to have workshops in the afternoon. And for residents and fellows, it's going to be free. That's right. 100% free for fellows and residents to attend. So save the date and we look forward to seeing you in March. Now, I wanted to give you a taste of just how good the C4 conference was in March. So our first lecture is right from that. And this lecture is given by Dr. Emily Damuth, who's one of our critical care and emergency medicine faculty. Her talk is going to be on the critically ill pregnant patient. Does one critically ill patient get you a little bit nervous? Well, how about two patients at the same time? Dr. Damuth is going to go over some strategies that you can use during your next shift to take care of the critically ill pregnant patient. So without further ado, here's Dr. Damuth. Thanks, Haney. So my goal today is really to explain how the physiology of pregnancy should impact your ventilator and airway management of the critically ill septic pregnant patient. And so around eight months ago, when Dr. Malamet told our group here at Cooper about this conference and I saw the impressive list of speakers, I started brainstorming ways in which I could maybe gain a little street credit in this topic. And I thought that the best way was to just be pregnant. <laughs> um, and so, so thanks to my, my husband there in the third row, he was, he's, he's an emergency physician and he's very committed to academics and so he was uh, more than happy to uh, help out and promote medical education. All right, so let's talk about a case. You have a young woman presenting to the ED with cough, fever, and hypoxia, and she's in some respiratory distress. And you, as the intensivist, get called down to see the patient. And after resuscitation, she still has, I think we would agree, marginal hemodynamics and oxygen saturations on a non-rebreather. And oh wait, the last thing they tell you before you come down is she's also 33 weeks pregnant and in her third trimester. <laughs> pregnant women scare intensivists. Boo. Um, and this is for good reason. Critical illness in pregnancy is rare, and it's not the most common thing that we see in our ICU. It's actually only about 1% of admissions to the ICU is a critically ill obstetric patient. And yet, pregnancy itself predisposes women to infection. During pregnancy, there's a down regulation of cell-mediated immunity. And that occurs for good reason. We want the mother to tolerate the paternally derived antigens of the fetus. So you don't want the mother to reject her own fetus, but unfortunately, this makes pregnant women susceptible to intracellular infections. So fungal infections, viral infections, encapsulated bacterial infections that are, most, are our most common cause of pneumonia. And the respiratory changes in pregnancy are probably the most profound, and while they are necessary to allow the fetus to have adequate oxygen delivery, they can really compl complicate and exacerbate the clinical course for the pregnant mother. So let's take a, a normal chest x-ray and superimpose upon it the physiologic changes of pregnancy. So by the third trimester, the diaphragm rises almost four centimeters, and the, the thorax actually widens in both the AP and the transverse dimensions by two centimeters each. So what does this do to pulmonary function in pregnancy? Well, it reduces functional residual capacity by 20%. You can think about this as a drop in the oxygen reserve in the face of increased oxygen consumption by 30% uh, due to the metabolic activity of the fetus. And as you can imagine, this makes pregnant women very susceptible to hypoxia during periods of apnea, like with RSI. And this has been studied and compared in term gravid patients. Their stats will drop twice as fast and the CO2 rises two and a half times as fast as a non-pregnant patient. So be careful with, with airway management and we'll talk about that. 
So to compensate for this increased CO2 production of the fetus, the minute ventilation rises by 40%, and it actually overshoots the CO2 production and produces a mild respiratory alkalosis. So a normal pH in a pregnant patient is around 7.4 to 7.47. And this is achieved through increased circulating levels of progesterone that actually act as a direct respiratory stimulus. And so the minute ventilation increases not by an increase in rate, but by an increase in tidal volume. And I think that that's important because if you get called on a consult like our patient who's tachypnic, you can't blame tachypnea on the normal physiology of pregnancy. There's some underlying either pulmonary pathology or acidosis. And on that note, the kidneys then excrete bicarb in order to compensate for this respiratory alkalosis. And this makes pregnant women less tolerant of further acidosis in the setting of AKI or other organ dysfunction. So I think we can all agree that our pregnant patient is decompensating and she's you know, using accessory muscles, she's not saturating very well in a non-rebreather and most likely will require intubation. And so how should you change your approach to airway management? Well, the first thing is that every pregnant woman should be considered to have a difficult airway. And we already touched on two main reasons for that. They're gonna desat quickly and the CO2 is going to rise quickly. But there are other, other factors that impact the difficulty of the airway. And one are the intestinal, gastrointestinal changes in pregnancy. So intestinal motility is slowed in the setting of an elevated abdominal pressure and also a reduction in lower esophageal sphincter tone. And you can imagine that this is, increases drastically the risk of both micro and massive aspiration and is one of the reasons that ARDS is 10 times more common in pregnancy. The other thing is that there are actually anatomic changes to the airway. By the third trimester, most women have edema, mucosal edema, elevated secretions, hyperemia, increased friability of the airway. And in the supine position, the gravid patient will occlude and narrow the upper airway much great, to a much greater extent than a non-pregnant patient. And this is actually unrelated to the weight gain that can occur in pregnancy. It's not just a function of BMI, the airway actually becomes edematous. So you may have to downsize your endotracheal tube to a six or a seven. So what about positioning for RSI? You're probably familiar with this study in chest. It was mostly men, so these weren't pregnant patients. And really, it did not show a benefit of the ramped over sniffing position as far as time to desaturation. Well, we see the exact opposite in the critical care obstetric literature. If you take a term gravid patient from completely supine to just raising the head of the bed 30 degrees, the FRC increases by 200 cc's. That's an increase in oxygen reserve. If you then sit her all the way up to pre oxygenator it'll increase by 900 more cc's. And in the OB anesthesia literature, this has translated to increasing the time to desaturation. So I would argue that we should pre in the upright position if, if she can tolerate it, and then intubate in the ramp position. There are also two other physiologic benefits to this. One is, if you're increasing the head of the bed, there's gonna be less intra-abdominal pressure to both increase your risk of aspiration as well as post-intubation hypotension from IVC compression. All right, so this is really the crux of our specific targets for mechanical ventilation in, in pregnancy, uh, critically ill pregnant patients. We have two patients to oxygenate, but we can only measure the oxygenation and ventilation of one patient. And so we really need to rely on fetal oxygen delivery and the principles that govern that. So number one, maternal O2 content. This is a change from what we do for non-pregnant patients. We need to drive that oxygen saturation above 95%. So the PAO2 needs to stay above 70. So why is that? Well, one, this is the, oh, there we go. So we're all familiar, the fetal hemoglobin dissociation curve is left shifted relative to adult hemoglobin. By the time maternal arterial blood makes it to the umbilical vein to oxygenate the fetus, the PO2 drops all the way to 30. And the only reason this adequately oxygenates the, the baby is the fetal hemoglobin has greater oxygen affinity. So we need to keep that PO2 above 70 in order to prevent fetal hypoxia. The second thing this, that impacts fetal oxygenation is uterine artery blood flow. Now two factors, both maternal, maternal cardiac output and mean arterial pressure uh, need to be maintained in order to perfuse the placenta, but also 
pH plays a major role here, and this is where we can either get in the way or help our patient oxygenate the fetus. So if the mother becomes severely alkalemic, this will left shift the maternal hemoglobin dissociation curve, and there will be less oxygen unloading to the placenta so the fetal can get hypoxic. Not to mention if the mother becomes too alkalemic, it vasoconstricts the uterine artery, and this can lead to decreased perfusion of the placenta. So again, that pH, 7.4 to 7.47 is normal. We do not want the mother to become severely alkalemic. What about the converse to that? Unfortunately, the converse is not true, that if we allow the mom to develop a respiratory, a respiratory acidosis, it doesn't further dilate the uterine arteries because the uterine arteries are already maximally dilated in pregnancy. By the third trimester, the uterus gets 10% of mom's cardiac output. And not to mention that if mom becomes acidemic and we allow this PCO2 to rise, like an ARDS, what happens is there needs to be a gradient of about 10 for the fetus to clear carbon dioxide to the placenta. And so if, mo if the mother becomes too acidemic, the fetus cannot clear the CO2, the fetus becomes acidemic, and now the fetal curve shifts this way, and we negate that whole increased oxygen carrying capacity of fetal hemoglobin, and it again causes fetal hypoxia. So we really have to operate in a narrow pH window in order to adequately oxygenate the fetus in pregnancy. So ARDS, unfortunately, is, is 10 times more common in pregnancy. And the reason for that is that pregnancy is the perfect cardiovascular setup for ARDS. So throughout pregnancy, the plasma volume increases by 1.5 liters. So you've got this elevated hydrostatic pressure. And yet the oncotic pressure falls because the albumin concentration is reduced. So you've got low oncotic pressure, high hydrostatic pressure, in pregnancy, and pregnancy is an inflammatory state for the mother. And now if you superimpose upon that an episode of sepsis or some other inflammatory insult, this makes pregnant women very prone to developing capillary leak and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This uh, is actually a chest x-ray from a patient cared for in our ICU. She was in the end of her second trimester and developed an obstructing left ureteral stone and gram-negative rod bacteremia and severe sepsis. She did not have a pulmonary infection, and yet she developed very impressive infiltrates, and the only thing more impressive than her x-ray is the fact that there's no endotracheal tube. And she actually did very well on high-flow nasal cannula and completely recovered without intubation, but this x-ray is a great pictorial representation of how close pregnant women, they're really one inflammatory insult away from capillary leak and the ARDS. All right, so the problem for us as intensivists is we like data, and pregnant women have been excluded from every single landmark critical care trial. But it doesn't mean we just throw these out the window, right? So we just have to look at the safety of our landmark critical care literature in ARDS and fuse that with what we know about fetal physiology as well as some expert opinion. And this is what I would argue that we should land on. Should we use long protective ventilation in pregnancy? Absolutely, there's no evidence to the contrary, so we should target 60 cc's per kilo ideal body weight with mechanical ventilation. But in order to get there, we need to be less permissive with hypercapnia. And this is based on neonatal studies that granted are not fetal studies, um, but showing that this is probably the best balance between avoiding that fetal acidosis, remember, that causes hypoxia but also being lung protective for mom. So not letting the PCO2 rise above 45 and trying to keep the pH um, north of 7.3 to ensure fetal oxygen delivery. We talked about the PAO2. We need to push it to 70 and keep it at 70 or above in order to avoid fetal hypoxia. What about plateau pressure? So this is an area of controversy. Uh, most authors, and, and I would agree that we should probably target and not deviate from ARDSnet, keep our plateau pressure under 30. There is the physiologic argument that respiratory compliance is reduced in pregnancy from the elevated abdominal pressure, reducing chest wall compliance. Unfortunately though, unless you're monitoring transpulmonary pressure, you're not gonna know whether your elevated plateau pressure at 35, if you allow it to be, is due to the chest wall versus the um, lowered lung compliance. And so the safest thing in the absence of monitoring is to keep it less than 30. What about PEEP? Well, we talked about the critically low FRC in pregnancy. Pregnant women love PEEP. Um, PEEP can really turn around oxygenation. The thing to think about, though, is that you already have a reduced venous return from your elevated abdominal pressure, 
So further increases in intrathoracic pressure may become more hemodynamically significant than in a non-pregnant patient. What about APRV? So APRV, similar to PEEP, elevating that mean airway pressure, there are some dramatic case reports and case series in the literature about women with severe ARDS in pregnancy responding to APRV. So it's definitely something we can use. Neuromuscular blockers, there's no absolute contraindication. So we should use these in the first 48 hours in severe ARDS. And then finally, as a last resort, VV ECMO. Um, for severe ARDS, this was probably best utilized in the 2009 H1N1 epidemic for influenza A, where maternal survival was actually 66% with 71% fetal survival. And the most common cause of death for pregnant women was actually hemorrhage. Uh, so this is something we can use. And then my final question, what about prone positioning? This is my all-time favorite intervention in all of critical care. You can see some potential barriers to this, but there's no absolute contraindication to prone positioning in pregnancy. There are several case reports discussing this successfully being used with two caveats. One is we should probably beyond 24 uh, weeks employ fetal monitoring. We wanna make sure that the, the fetus can handle the positioning. And then two, we need to position and bolster the pelvis in a way that we're not causing compression of the uterus or the uterine vasculature. Um, but it absolutely has been used successfully and, and drastically has helped. So just to wrap up, how do we optimize the airway and breathing and circulation of the critically ill obstetric patient? One is be cautious with the airway. It may be difficult. Um, and consider pre-oxygenation in the upright position to increase your oxygen reserve and then intubate in the ramped position. For ARDS, yes to lung protective ventilation, but be less permissive with both hypoxia and hypercapnia and try to keep your plateau pressure below 30. And then for severe oxygenation failure, we can turn to our, our therapies that have a mortality benefit outside of pregnancy, like prone positioning, neuromuscular blockers, as well as using PEEP and APRV and reserving VV ECMO for um, those as a last resort. So that's all I have, thanks. Thanks, Emily. A uh, quick question for you. Is it okay if I ask you a controversial question? So there's no right or wrong answer, I guess. Um, do you think that if you live in an area where there's a tertiary care center and a critically ill pregnant patient goes to a non-tertiary care center, should they be transferred? Or with the tips that you've given, can they be adequately managed over there? That's a good question. So I think, you know, it's, it's hard for me to comment being at sort of the receiving end. I think it depends depends on the, the comfort of the physician. Um, what I would say is that, again, with the lowered immunity, um, the, the cardiovascular and respiratory changes in pregnancy, they're much more likely to go into ARDS and for that to become severe. And so if you think there's a chance that someone may need you know, advanced strategies on the ventilator or um, VV ECMO, it would be better to be in a center that can escalate to that. Uh, because we saw that chest x-ray, that woman didn't even have a pulmonary infection. And within 24 hours, 36 hours, her x-ray looked that way. So I think the thing I would say is that pregnant women are really at the edge of a cliff with regard to their fluid and respiratory status. And so being in a center that can provide therapy should they decompensate, I think is important. Yeah.